Buenos días, church. ¿Cómo están? It is always a pleasure to see you here. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone's here. Welcome, everyone online. You know, the last three weeks uh, I was in Mexico. Uh, I saw some brothers and sisters from the church in there. I, we visited uh, a few churches over there in Mexico. And, you know, I remember the first time that, that we planned to come here to the U.S. For, for moving out from Mexico, change our life completely. And we, we were scared. You know, we were really scared because everyone in the church in Guadalajara were just so lovely with us. We made a, a, a lot of great friendships over there. And we got this fear like, you know, what if, what if the guys in Detroit just, uh, you know, that they are not so lovely as, as, as they are here in Mexico, you know? And, you know, it was, it was always uh, lovely to trust in God. You know, I want to share you this scripture in, in John 13, 35, that says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And, you know, we leave that scripture here when we came. And it was amazing, the, 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 the friendships that we come here to, to get, to know many, many people in here. And we just felt loved in here, you know. And not, now I can imagine my life with the, outside of the U.S., you know, outside of the church in Detroit. So it is amazing. Now, you know, I, I want to teach you one more word here to, to show love to each other in here. So if, if you could uh, help me, please stand up just for a few seconds, church. And, you know, we want to welcome everyone that is coming from the church, right? So I want to teach you to say, bienvenido. 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 Right, that's welcome in Spanish, right? So please uh, go for, for, the, for the person that is next to you and grab his hand. If, if you want to hug, you can hug and say, bienvenido. Bienvenidos, hermanos. Great. Amazing church. So now, please, uh, <laughs> now join me in a prayer for the service that everything's in God's control. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you very much for this awesome day that we have today. Uh, thank you for everyone that is here preparing for the service. Thank you very much for the worship team. Thank you very much for everyone that has prepared a message today for us, Father. Please uh, stay in control of everything that is happening here. Open our hearts so we can be open and humble and learn a lot of things from you, Father. We also ask you this morning for AJ's, Jacob's parents' health, Father, that we know that you are in control. You know, we know that you are there for them, Father. Please allow us to help uh, the way that we can, Father, but we know that you are there with us. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray and say thanks. Amen. Amen. Gracias, church. All right, I don't even have to tell you guys to stand. There's not a friend. There's not a friend like the lowly. And we're singing, no, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our souls. Again, no, not one, no, but Jesus knows, and He will guide us till our days come. There's not a friend like the Lord. No, not one, no, not one, no, not one. There's not an enemy so high and low. Again, no, not one, no, not one, and yet no friend. 
All right, church. Um, if you haven't noticed, we've decided that we want to worship God this morning. We're going to praise God this morning. And that's kind of like the theme that I was uh, led with when building the service. So this song in particular is about counting on just one thing. And please sing from that place. Let's sing to God. Very softly when you're ready. for God. Um, today, I got baptized 17 years ago. I was 19. I was in college and I was wild. <laughs> I was wild. But I was also sick and tired of being in this crazy cycle of um, drinking water from broken cisterns. I was sick and tired of it. Uh, you know what that's like to be winning but losing at the same time. Does that make sense? Um, this song is about the Lamb of God. 
And that's who I'm singing to. baptized uh, 17 years ago, there was a time where in that journey I decided, hey God, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to turn around. I don't really want to do this much anymore. And uh, it was important for me to learn that um, I belong to God. When I had my son, um, I remember feeling like I wanted a haircut, I wanted a suit on, I washed up a couple of times because I was like, okay, I'm going to hold this new baby. I called my dad, and I said, Dad, how did you feel when you were going to have us? And I explained it to him, and he said, that's exactly how I felt. And then I thought, God, is that how you feel? I remember a moment of coming to my senses, and it was like, you're mine. So my response was, I will glorify you. Hallelujah. 
to the King of kings. Alleluia to the Lamb. Alleluia to the Lord. Sing hallelujah Lord. again, church. Who is the great Sing hallelujah. I am. Sing hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have, um, it, it is my privilege this morning to um, introduce you guys to an amazing sister. Um, she's been a disciple for over 17 years. Um, like all of us, um, had some um, heartaches and some challenges, but I have never met someone so on fire for God um, through all of it. Um, she is a personal inspiration to myself, and um, I'm sure to all the people that um, she touches in her life. Um, her zeal for God is just contagious, and if you don't know who I'm talking about uh, by now, I recommend that you get to know her. T to share her thoughts on uh, the cross this morning, uh, here's Janet Brown. Good morning, church. As Kevin stated, my name is Janet Brown, and I also have been a disciple for 17 years. Um, during that 17 years, um, my zeal for God just continued to, I had ups and downs, but it continued to grow because God, Jesus is Lord of my life. I have three children and five grandchildren. Nine years ago, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition. Five years later, my husband and I took a trip abroad. While abroad, I, I got very sick and ended up in the ICU. For three days, I was in the ICU, not knowing if I was going to live or die, but God knew. And as you can see, God healed and brought us back here. So for that, I continue to ask God what my purpose. And from there, I continue to, in prayer, drawing my life ups and down, knowing that God is always there. I continue to love the way he loved, continue to know when, I, when I fall short that prayer and his word is there to pick me up. And also, God taught us about one another, how we can encourage one another. While I was sick in Dubai, I went to Dubai. Um, <laughs> while I was sick there, God, there were sisters here in Michigan and brothers and also in North Carolina who was praying for me. I was praying and giving God thanks because I'm a disciple. I wasn't, I know that being a disciple of God, if I die, that I know I was with God. Coming back, my zeal just continued to grow, and God uses that opportunity to build my faith and to change my character. He took a few, coming out the pandemic about a few years ago, I went to church, and as I went to church, there was a flyer where there is a church in Springfield, Illinois, which I never know or heard of, was looking for someone to come and take a one-year challenge to help rebuild the church. Without any 
thoughts or my zeal was like, God, this is me. This is a call for, for me to get up out of my comfort zone and serve in the kingdom, to go and encourage my brother and sister. God took me there for six months, and he molded me by showing my character of how I can doubt. He showed me how to love. He showed me how not to judge. He changed my whole aspect of what the meaning of king, being in the kingdom is all about, giving of myself, to deny myself. I went to a place that I never knew, but no, knowing that Jesus is Lord and met 25 sisters and brothers, what, Michelle Lutz and Josh Lutz at that time all went to lead the church there. They were so encouraged, and I was even more encouraged. Um, it, I know how to be still and hear the voice of God. That draw me closer. It gives me time to experience when Jesus says, I'm here, my child. And I'm going through my ups, and when I'm going through my down, Jesus is nearby. To put my trust in him and not to put my trust in the world, because the world have nothing to offer. Um... During my time of going to Springfield, God, I lost my husband. And I, um, I was retired at the time. The scripture I'm about to read allow me to see how God has blessed me through all my 17 years of journey. And allow me to encourage those who are around me or those who I don't know to trust in God, even when it seems hopeless. It gives me hope, confident in myself to know that. He says, trust me and trust not man. The scripture I'm about to read is found in James 1, verses 12. It says, blessed is the one who persevere under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And that is found in 1 Peter 1.12. Now, I encourage all of us that the crown is eternity. It's not here. God took me away from my comfort zone and took me to Springfield where I met brothers and sisters, and also have a new family in the kingdom. So I thank God for how he continued to mold me, and I worship him. I give him praise and honor because I'm not worthy. So thank you for having me to share just a little bit of how God is working in my life and making making sure that I know that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, and he will never forsake me. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Almighty God and Father, we just come before you uh, right now at this time to remember um, just how much your son has done for us and uh, how he calls us to go places that sometimes we don't want to or maybe are uncomfortable how sometimes we have doubt, but God, we can all overcome that through the cross. I pray right now that, um, that our thoughts and our hearts and our minds will reflect on Jesus and his sacrifice for us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can give two ways. You can give online at the Detroit Church of Christ, or you can give in the black box in the back. Please do so as we give today. So let us pray. Dear Lord, uh, just so grateful that we get to have this time to, you know, reflect on what you've given us, right? To, to remind us that our treasures aren't stored here on earth, but they're stored up in heaven. Um, let us give, you know, what we have so freely from our heart that we can sacrifice and, and be so thankful for the, the gifts and the talents that you've given us and that we can give it right back to you, God. In your name I pray, amen.
Thank you. All right, and so now is the time in our series where we will have some announcements, and I, you can tell I'm, I'm not John Jacobs, so sorry to let you down. He, he's cheering on his son at the uh, National uh, uh, Dodgeball Championships right now, so pray for, uh, pray for Aiden. And we're going to have Alicia give an announcement about Detroit Kids. Good morning, church. <laughs> So my name is Alicia, like Andrew said, um, I am the director of the Detroit Kids. And so I just wanted to let you guys know about VBS. So VBS is gonna be coming this year to our church. We're gonna be doing the theme called Stellar. And so we're gonna be focusing on shining Jesus's light. That's what the kids are gonna focus on this year. So due to logistics, we're gonna do VBS a little bit different this year. We're gonna be having it during church service on Sundays. Um, so the dates are May 28th through June 25th. So those Sundays, and then I think we will get a slide up. If not, you'll see it on the church calendar. If you guys have the printout copy, and I think it's also online, you can see the Sundays that we will be doing BBS during church. So this will be super exciting for the kids. They're going to be back there worshiping. They're going to be doing, um, watching a Bible lesson. They're going to be having crafts and snacks. It's going to be such a great opportunity. Um, so I do want to remind you, let's invite our friends and our families out. And the great thing about this is that they will be able to, the kids will go back there and the parents can stay in here and worship with you all. So it'll be a great time for everyone to be able to enjoy. So we look forward to BBS this year. Thank you for your support. All right, that sounds like it'll be great. I uh, just want to give a, a special shout out. So we have with us uh, Jasmine Holt. Uh, many of you probably remember. Uh, you may remember her as, as Jasmine Pearson, but she got married and moved to Madison, Wisconsin. So she's with us here uh, to, to visit with us. I uh, also want to remind us, uh, Special Missions is this month, so we'll be giving our Special Missions contribution. Uh, we'll be celebrating that contribution on April 30th, and, and you've heard how that's uh, going to be divided up, uh, so I don't think I need to go over that again, but we will refresh as we get closer. Uh, but it's going to be going to a lot of great things uh, around the world and here uh, in the Midwest and in Michigan, so uh, please uh, uh, have it on your heart uh, and minds to give for our Special Missions collection that we'll be taking. Uh, also, another reminder, softball signups are live. Do not miss out. You have to sign up uh, in order to play, and you have to sign up before the league uh, uh, draft, which will be a week before the league starts. So you can find out how to uh, register at DetroitChurch.org. Uh, also, another deadline coming up for the men's camping trip. Uh, so that, that qualifies for about half of the room here. So uh, go online, and you can sign up. The link to that is at DetroitChurch.org as well. Uh, ben Weatherston is organizing an amazing weekend for the men uh, to get refreshed and, and to have a great time in God's creation. And the registration for that, the deadline is going to be uh, uh, May 15th. So please register ahead of that deadline if you'd like to go. Um, also, uh, Midwest Youth Camps. So if you have children, uh, uh, fifth grade and up, you can uh, sign them up for camps uh, at DetroitChurch.org. The link to that is there, uh, and you can sign them up for the Midwest Youth Camps. Um, check online on our website. There's a ton more events that we don't have time to talk about. So uh, I'm going to read a, a card from the, the Nelsons now. Um, uh, Detroit family, we thank you for your love and sympathy shown during our time of loss. Words can't express our sincere gratitude. Thank you for those who attended, helped at the repass, words of encouragement, cards, gifts, and flowers. It will all be cherished. We love you. Your brother in Christ, Walter Nelson and family. So uh, thank you all for encouraging the Nelsons and continue to show encouragement and support. Um, at this time, please silence your phones as we enter our fellowship break, and we'll be hearing a sermon from Sean Alexander in just a little bit. Uh, you are dismissed for fellowship break.
Good morning, church. So good to see you all. My name is Sean Alexander, and I am a a member of the church here. I'm not a a preacher. I'm not trained, uh, but I've been a disciple of Jesus since 1995, and and that's the greatest training we could have. Uh, I'm also known as a, so I get to preach uh, maybe once or twice a year. I'm known as a crying preacher. My my kids always ask me, my daughter asked me right here, are you going to cry? I'm like, I can't, I can't stop it if I wanted, so you just never know. Before service today, so there's a, there's a, uh, a couple here, uh, Byron and Melinda Johnson, and they, they were members of the church years ago, and then they, they walked away for a time. They've been back for, what, a year or so, rebuilding their faith, being restored to the fellowship, and, and before church, I was talking to, to Byron, so Melinda was up here warming up with the singers, and she looked so happy. So natural, like right where she belongs. And I asked Byron, are, are you going to go up there? Right? He said, to sing? I said, no, to preach. He said, I'll do it if you do it. <laughs> so, so Byron, here I am. <laughs> the, the church has been doing a, a series this month called Write the Future. Yeah. And Mark introduced it. And, and really the idea is that God can help us overcome the obstacles in our lives that we are not held back. Sometimes we can feel like our past or our sin or even the generational sin handed down to us can write a script for us that is difficult to escape. And the idea is that our faith in God can write a different future for us. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Would you like to know your future? What what would you like to know about your future? (laughs) How much would you like to know about your future? And what would you do with it? My, uh, my father had uh, Alzheimer's disease, and uh, we often think of Alzheimer's as it steals your memory. It really steals your presence. It steals your identity. It slowly degenerates over five or seven years and really steals who you are. And you know, we lost him uh, in 2016. His mother had Alzheimer's disease, 
So, and she got it at a much younger age. So naturally, I'm thinking, I'm a candidate. I kind of assume I'm going to get Alzheimer's. So, you know, there's a part of me that thinks, oh, do I want to know? So I, I look at research when articles come out, and, and there was an article about there's a gene that they can, if they identify this gene, you're like 84% chance, more likelihood of having Alzheimer's. Do I want to know that? Uh, I, I read, there, Alzheimer's is about this beta amyloid plaque that builds up in your brain. And I read an article about six weeks ago about they can detect it earlier in your eye, like decades before the onset. And I think, would I want to know that, I, I, what if I knew that, uh, would I feel like I have a, a sentence upon me? Would I feel like my future is written? Or would I rather not know? Because there's no cure. So the only thing I really can do is take preventative measures like diet, exercise, sleep, remain social, and keep learning new things. Right. And if I do that anyway, isn't that a great life? Yeah. So if you knew your future, what would you do with it? Would you feel it's a sentence? Or would you do something different? I'm going to share with you some thoughts today from the book of Ecclesiastes. And in the Bible, there's three books that we call the wisdom literature. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And in Ecclesiastes, King Solomon at the time, he, he was known as being the wisest man on earth. And King Solomon wrote down his observations. So, so Proverbs we like. Proverbs is kind of like these, these ideas that are generally true. Like, hey, plant your seeds and you'll get a harvest. Yeah. Teach your kids and they'll do what's right. You know, it's kind of like a formulaic. Ecclesiastes is more, he's like, hey, I observed some things. Solomon did a sort of, he observed humankind. He, he did kind of social experiments in his own life. He, Let me try this and see what happens. And then he wrote down the observations. There's three I'm going to share with you, but I'll warn you, they're kind of dark, okay? <laughs> and the first observation that he made is about the march of time. Right. And he said, generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. So our lives in the cosmic scheme of things are but a blip. I mean, who remembers their great-great-grandparents? Do you know their names? Of the generations that came before you? I mean, we love our kids and our grandkids, but our kids' kids, they may have no idea who we are and what our significance was, and that's just... Solomon says, I've observed, that's just a fact of life. Yeah. The second thing is that we're all going to die. Yeah. Solomon said, surely the fate of human beings is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. The same destiny overtakes all. All this madness, then they join the dead of a depressing thought, but, you know, I think we all know that that's, that's reality. And the third thing that he shares is, is kind of equally troubling. It's life's random nature. Solomon observed the race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Time and chance. You know, Proverbs, we like to believe, it's kind of this formula. If I do, if I embrace wisdom, good things are going to happen. And Solomon's not saying that that's false. He says, yes, embrace wisdom. But also, don't deny that time and chance happen. You know, we plan for the future. We invest. We save our money. You build a retirement. And then a scammer drains your bank account. Or the market crashes right when you retire. Right. That's time and chance. Right. You know, we eat good, we take good care of ourselves, we get diagnosed with a life-altering disease. Yeah. I mean, you can even step funny getting out of bed and slip a disc. Yeah. I mean, time and chance, we like to think we're in control, yeah. but we're really not. Yeah. Uh, both of my children are uh, scouts uh, in the Boy Scouting program, and... They sell uh, uh, holiday greens at, the, at Christmas time. They sell wreaths and they sell garlands. Some of the members here have bought from us. And my son and I, one, uh, a, a couple years ago, were delivering his holiday greens in our old town of Ferndale. 
And on our way back, it's a Sunday afternoon after church, we're delivering greens, and we're driving down the road, 25 miles an hour, just in a neighborhood, and somebody ran a stop sign. You're thinking at 25 miles an hour, that, 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 that's, that's what happened at 25 miles. You see the other car, you see his holiday greens in the back? You know, so we, did, we didn't deliver all his greens. We think time and chance. You can be careful as possible. And you think three seconds later, three seconds earlier, you know, could have been different. Now, we, we weren't hurt. We crawled out. We, we were fine. But you think about life, and we want to have control. The, the writer of Ecclesiastes, the point he's making is that we don't really have control of things, so quit trying. Quit trying to have control over the details of our lives. Because time and chance. And so his advice is enjoy your work. Enjoy what you put your hand to. Enjoy the food on your table. Enjoy the people in your lives. He says enjoy, enjoy life with your wife. All your meaningless days on earth, he says after that. But it, so what we, really the only thing that we have control over is our attitude toward the present moment. The only thing we can really control is our attitude toward the present moment. We can't control the past. We can't control the future. We can't even control the present moment because of time and chance. All we can control is our attitude towards it. And what does that mean? So we're going to talk a little bit about the attitudes that we can have towards the present moment. So if we're going to control our attitude towards the present moment, we kind of need to be in touch with what our attitudes are, okay, towards the present moment. So I'm going to just share some attitudes that we can have towards the present moment. And we're going to start out with one that I struggle with, which is selfishness. Selfishness. Uh, there's a, a couple in the church here, Pete and Dina Fox, and they serve in the music mi- ministry here. And uh, they, a few years ago, they downsized. They sold their home and they moved to an apartment. And as I'm helping them move out their, their home, Pete said, Hey, would you like my gas grill? I'm not going to need it in my apartment. I don't have room for it in my apartment. I said, Yeah, I love that gas grill. And so I, 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 and I'm looking around like, What else does Pete not? need. <laughs> Pete, Pete, you're not going to need that drill. You can't drill holes in your apartment. You know, you, you start looking at it in terms of what can I get out of this situation? You know, when I go to a retirement party, I'm thinking about the cake. Okay. When am I going to get a piece? They haven't cut it yet. Uh, shamefully, sometimes when I go to a funeral home, I'm thinking, I know there's a room around here with a little tray of cookies and cold cuts. Because that's what they do. The family needs that. Uh, years ago, um, uh, my wife's Uncle Carl passed away. And so we went to the funeral, and I'm sitting with my sister-in-law, and I said, did you see where we're going for dinner? We're going to Hartville Kitchen. And they got good food. She said, no, yeah, but we have to pay for that. I said, no, 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 no. Let me tell you how this works. The family pays for that. <laughs> and now, none of those are necessarily egregious sins. But when you, when you look at things in terms of personal benefit, what I'm going to get out of it, uh, Judas Iscariot went and said, what will you give me to betray Jesus? And he said, how, how about silver, 30 silver coins? He's like, yeah, that'll, that'll do. That's good. In 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 13, King David's son Abnon isolated and violated his sister. When we look at the present, when our attitude toward the present moment is about personal benefit and selfish gain, sure. we write a future of scheming and double-mindedness and depravity. Uh, another attitude I can struggle with towards the present future or towards the present moment is uh, frustration. 
And I think frustration is something everybody feels. Does everybody feel frustration about people, situations, frustration about ourselves? I think, but it's something we don't talk about much, frustration. You know, frustration is when things aren't going our way. I want something to happen, and it's not. I want something with this person, and it's not happening. We th- have an idea how things should go, and they don't go that way. I get frustrated with physics. I'm like, I drop my highlighter, and it rolls under the couch. I'm like, why? Why would you roll under the couch? I'm talking to, why would you roll under the couch? I drop my gummy vitamin, and it bounces under the stove. Now it has crumbs and hair. I think, why? Why? I get frustrated. And my wife will say, you know, you are so irritated lately. Why? Like everything, you're just irritated and frustrated about stuff. And we need to have that, that awareness about our frustration. Uh, students, you know, students can be frustrated by that. I can't get this math assignment. I can't figure this assignment out. Like, I can't figure out what this teacher wants. My son would say, the teacher wants to know the, the red door on the building. What did it represent? What did those, the author thinking at the time? He said, I don't care. You know, we can get frustrated <laughs> with people and situations. You know, frustration can well up and we reach this point of no return. Yeah. Frustration, the, the word frustrate, frustration, frustrating, it's in the Bible 12 times. And six of those times it's God doing the frustrating. Mm. Which is kind of a neat little study, like God frustrates people's efforts. Like, hey, that's kind of interesting in itself, you know, when you think about that. When our attitude toward the present moment is frustration, we write a future of giving up on ourselves. And we can write a future tension in relationships and people even avoiding us because they know what they're going to get. Okay, so, so far we've learned that I'm going to get Alzheimer's, we're all going to die, But it doesn't matter because no one remembers us, so you can't control anything, and I'm selfish and frustrated. Is that what we talk about here on Sundays, people? we got to turn this thing around and talk about some things that are a little more positive. So let's talk about some other, some positive attitudes toward the present moment. Let's talk about humility. Humility is an attitude we can have towards the present moment. And what is humility? I mean, humility is, and a lot of great things about humility, I just thought of these, you could think of these too, the ability to be taught, the ability to walk into a situation, not having all the answers, yeah. uh, giving people the benefit of the doubt, not sizing people up and having your mind made up, yeah. but walking into a situation thinking, oh, what can I learn from this situation? And I don't have all the answers. Seeing intrinsic value in people, not judging them by, their, by what you see. You know, we can look at our mistakes and learn from them. We're not defined by our failures. We're taught by them. Some of the greatest demonstration I've ever seen of humility is in recovering alcoholics. I, I've become close with uh, two alcoholics, um, two recovering alcoholics. Uh, a recovering alcoholic never calls themselves a recovered alcoholic. But like, I am recovering, and I will be recovering the rest of my life. And, and these men, you know, I, I, I think when, when you have tasted the depth of the consequences of your sin, when you have seen the damage that it does in, in your life and other people's lives, it gives you a great sense of, of humility at what you're capable of. Now, we don't all have to be recovering alcoholics to have that same sense of, man, I've seen what I'm capable of, my sin, my selfishness, and, and I'm going to walk into situations with humility and choose it rather than waiting for it to be chosen for me. The one brother told me the scariest thing to him uh, in the midst of his alcoholism is that his ears were closed to the Holy Spirit. He said, that is scary. I never want to be in that place again. But let's not, uh, let's not be so hard that we have to go through those kind of depths. When our attitude towards the present moment is humility, we write a future of learning, of growing, and of connecting with people. Another great attitude towards the present moment is joy. And and I really believe joy is one of those hallmarks of the Christian faith. True joy is something that we get from our faith. 
And when we see someone full of joy, it's uplifting. Yet when we see somebody void of joy, it's sad. I think children are the greatest examples of joy. Yeah. I love children. I love your children. I especially love you know, these three, four, five, six-year-olds running around. When you see the pure joy of a child, it's, it's really great. And I think children are joyful because they don't know how dangerous the world is yet. Like they, they don't have circumstances that have stolen their joy. They, they don't have broken relationships that last for years. They, they, they are unaware of the dangers of life. And then we become teens. We start to realize, man, the world is scary. It's dangerous. It's hard. It's people are, people are mean and rude. We become adults. And then we, our circumstances can steal our joy. And that's why I say it's a hallmark of the Christian faith because true joy is not based on circumstances. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says that about Jesus, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross scorning its shame. For the joy set before him, the joy set before Jesus was us. It's our faith. It's our salvation. The joy set before Jesus was obeying the Father and pleasing the Father. And his example shows that we can, because of joy, we can overcome difficult circumstances. His joy, he had to go endure the cross, but that didn't steal his joy. That wasn't an obstacle to his joy. I think joy feels good. I think when you're joyful, you feel joyful. Uh, for me, joy comes uh, from three areas that, that I really derive a lot of joy. One, one is, is when I confess my sins and I lighten what's on my heart, there's a lightness of, about confession and repentance that just gives me great joy. Uh, another sense I get of joy is, uh, is reconciling relationships. When you have a difficult relationship, the heaviness on you, the tension, avoiding people because it reminds you of, of the relationship, when you resolve that, it gives you an, a, a sense of joy. When we lack joy, we're heavy. When our attitude towards the present moment is joy, we write a future of inspiring joy in other people. And joy really is its own reward. These are just a few examples I thought of of attitudes towards the present moment. And I invite you to please think of your own, even in your, your quiet time this week. Think about attitudes that you struggle. I, I thought about things like fear. Fear is a great prejudice. Uh, the, the way we view, view people. Uh, as well as faith, hope, and love are attitudes that we can have towards the present moment that can write a future for us. But there's a bigger question is how do we how can we have uh, a better attitude in the present moment? Because, as, as I mentioned, that's the only thing we really have control over. How can we control our attitude in the present moment? Just wake up tomorrow and feel better? Just try harder? What can we do? And you don't just wake up you know, and feel more joy. And really, we need to be renewed. We need to be transformed. You could even say we need to be converted. And, uh, you know, we as believers, we believe the thing we need to be converted to is we need to be converted to Christ. Yes. And we're going to spend the rest of our, our time here looking at Titus chapter 2. I, I'll have slides. You could turn there if you really wanted to. Maybe you want to underline it. But we'll be looking in Titus 2. At the gospel message. So, let's take a look at that. First, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the first thing it says is that for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It doesn't say the fist of God has appeared to punish all people. Yeah. It doesn't say the chains of God have appeared to control all people. It says the grace of God has appeared, and this is an offer of salvation to everyone. Who wouldn't want the grace of God? What does the grace of God do? It teaches us. This, is from, this isn't my idea. This is from Titus 2. The grace of God has appeared to offer salvation to all people. It teaches us. God's grace teaches us. I thought, well, I thought God's grace forgives us. Or I thought God's grace uh, enables me to do what I want. Well, this says God's grace teaches us. Because we're a people who need to be taught. Yeah. We need to be taught about God's grace. We need to be taught about life. What does it teach us? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions 
and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Now, we can think, well, I thought God's grace allows me to have ungodliness and worldly passions. Well, no, God's grace is not a license for us to sin. His grace actually teaches us to say no. God's grace helps us become something we're not because we're a people who need to be taught because in our flesh we choose ungodliness and worldly passions and we need to be taught. We don't one day, if I had an altar call at the end and everybody came up and had an emotional moment, you wouldn't then have been converted and now you don't have ungodliness and worldly passions. We need to be taught. We need to be taught at the beginning of our faith. We need to be taught when we're coming back to our faith. We need to be taught when we're 17 years in our faith, we heard today, 30 years in our faith. We need to continue to be taught and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. That's how we're going to write our attitude and control our attitude in the present moment. It says we need to be taught to say no while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, so we, are a people, we are a people in the present moment. We are waiting for a future moment. Uh, God has already written the future. He says, I've written the future, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we kind of, in a way, we know the future. God has already written it, and he invites us to be a part of it. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. What I really like about this is is this talks about Jesus was preparing for himself a people. We can sometimes think of salvation as this individual thing. Hey, how do I get my sins forgiven? How do I get saved? How do I get my sins forgiven? How do I get right with God? And there's a piece of that, but we often can think about, this is about me, and I want to get my sins forgiven. And this is that Jesus gave himself up to purify for himself a people, a community of people that are his very own who are eager to do what is good. And that really speaks to the, our attitude toward the present moment, being eager to do what is good. There, there's a, uh, a little treasure that's hidden right here in plain sight that I want to show you. So it talks here about the grace of God has appeared, but we are waiting for the appearing. So the grace of God has appeared once, we're waiting for the appearing to happen again. And there's a theology in our faith, a kingdom theology that says, Jesus is the Lord of those who have chosen him to be the Lord. But one day he'll be the Lord of all the earth. Right now, all the earth does not acknowledge Jesus as the Lord. But one day, all the earth will. It'll be the appearing of our great God and Savior. We're the people who kind of live between those times. We live between the appearing and the appearing. We live in this present age. Yet we live in the present age knowing that the future has been written. And I hope that that can really enable us and empower us as we think about deciding our attitude in the present moment. It's because we know the future is already written. There's a few scriptures like this that kind of, cap, they kind of sum up the entire gospel message. And, and this is one, I encourage you to uh, memorize the scripture. This is really the entire gospel message. This is what we, we live for as disciples of Jesus. Uh, our, family is, um, our family will be uh, is planning a trip to Honduras this, this summer. And you've heard announced a few times about... Uh, that, that Hope Worldwide is planning, they call them these medical brigades to, the third, to uh, Central America. And the trip we're going on, it, it's like that. It's not organized by Hope Worldwide. It's organized by members of uh, the church in Salt Lake City. And uh, they'll be, they've been doing this medical, medical brigade since 2015. Now, our brother Luke Simon uh, moved here from Salt Lake City about six months ago. Now, now, there's a lesson in time and chance. I didn't even know there was a Luke Simon six months ago. And now he's taking my family to Honduras. Now he's getting the single brothers together and feeding them and having a good time. And when you think of, you never know what's on the horizon. Who's going to be walking into your life? You know, Luke Simon walked into our lives and is changing our lives in amazing ways. So anyway, we're going to this this trip to Honduras. And uh, my wife is filling out our passports. Okay, so she's in the other room and she's filling out the passports. And she says to me, you know, height. And I tell her. She says, "Uh, weight. And I tell her. 
uh, eyes, so hazel, hair color. <laughs> That's what I said. So, hair color. I'm like, uh, th th is, there, is there salt and pepper on there? Is there like, is there one called Becoming Gray? And she said, no, it, it's brown or gray. And she said, well, no, your hair's still brown in the back. I said, the immigration officer is going to be looking at the front. So and she gave me these encouraging words. She said, well, your passport will be good for 10 years. I'm like, okay, gray, check gray. Yeah. Now, I, I've been turning gray for, uh, I've been turning gray for like, well, 19 years. That's how old my son is. I've been turning gray about 19 years, becoming gray. And I'm fine with it. We, we laugh and we joke about it. But now I'm on record with the State Department as being gray. <laughs> but, but it is a reminder that I'll, I'll be 50 in June. It, 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 it's a reminder that my, there's more past for me probably than future. You know? And, and I know all of us, we kind of go through that as you go through milestones in life and birthday milestones. We realize, you know, my, my past is growing and my future is shrinking. You know, but as, but as we've learned today, that doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter because we don't have control. We, we all have a common destiny. We don't have control over the future. What we really have control over is our attitude toward the present moment. So let's work on that. Let's work on our attitude toward the present moment so that we can write a future that glorifies God. <clears throat> Let us pray together. Almighty God, uh, your word is full of so many treasures, Father. Truths in your word that inspire us, that challenge us, that help us to become what we're not. Father, I pray we continue to look to your word to teach us. Together, we look to your grace to teach us. But Father, we look to our lives as well with a sobriety to understand who we are, where we're at, and Father, how your grace teaches us. Father, thank you for making us a people that are Jesus' very own, eager to do what is good. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Sean, great message. All right, guys, at this time, if we could all stand for our last song. And just uh, as we sing here, we're going to talk about another characteristic of God. We're going to talk about how he's our friend. Who am I?
church. Sing God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me. Abraham friend. God Almighty, Lord of glory, you have called me friend. Let's sing it one more time, church. Let's sing God Almighty, Lord Dismissed parents, please pick up your kids from Detroit Kids.